exam. I'll post the grades later today. I think that um, this is often the case in thermodynamics where I think that um, I think that when people use the process that I'm talking about that's a little more general, right? And it's a it's kind of a standard flow chart that you can flow through for from any kind of different question really, then people tended to do better on problems that are maybe a little bit unlike problems that you'd seen before. And it's certainly likely on an exam that you'll get at least one of those problems in the long answer section. So um, I would encourage everyone, I know it's tough because these are like online and open book. Um, you know, I think there's this tendency to maybe try to accumulate different homework solutions and then um, look for the homework solution that looks the most like the, the exam problem. Um, I, I think, just in my mind anyway, at least the way I think about thermodynamics and the way I try to teach thermodynamics, is that the best way to approach these problems is with the systematic process that, um, that we're trying to teach here in class. Um, now, if you ever have questions about that process, um, you're certainly welcome to come to office hours and talk to me. And if the office hour times that we don't have don't work with your schedule, please let me know and we'll try to work out a time um, that makes sense. So the other thing that I said at the beginning of the semester, right, is a couple of things about the grading. So first is that um, typically we free ourselves to ask difficult problems by looking at the relative grades of people in the class, right? Now that's harder to do when you only have five people because the uh, sample size isn't large enough. So in addition to kind of, you know, rescaling the grades in a, sim in a similar way that we normally would, the other thing that I'm gonna do is move from, right now, you know, if you look at my courses, the way that it calculates your midterm grade is by equally weighting all of the parts, right? Now I can change that to, to change the weighting of each individual part. But I don't think, at least if it's possible to do, I don't know how to do it. I don't think I can do that dynamically for every student. So what it looks like in my courses will not change. But what I'm going to do when I'm actually calculating your final grade, which I do anyway, because we have three different grading schemes. Remember that the final exam can overwrite either of your midterms, not both, but one or the other of your midterms if you score higher on the final than you do on either one of the midterms. But in addition to that, what I will do for everyone in the class is I'll look at the three parts of both midterms and the lowest graded question, I'll weight as 20% instead of 33%. The sort of middle graded question, I'll rate as 25% instead of 33%. And then the, uh, the question you did the best on, I will weight as 55%, uh, which I believe is the remainder there if I did the math right. So, um, so this is something that will help everyone, uh, particularly, it's particularly helpful for people who, who maybe felt like they got tripped up on, on one particular question in the exam. Like, uh, so obviously it, it will, the worst this can do is, is have you break even if, for example, you got the same grade on, on all three parts, then changing the weight doesn't matter. But otherwise, it will increase your grade, and it will increase um, the low end tail higher than it does probably the other pieces. Um, so if you scored poorly on one of the exam questions, this will help you out at least a little bit. Part of this is because I've had a couple people reach out to me and ask if they, if they should drop the class. Um, I think that because we have the ability to overwrite one of the exam pro one of the exams, right? So that's like, I can't remember the grading. Is it 25% of your grade, right? And the final is 30. So, you know, right now locked in, right? We have really only the quiz and homework grades and whatever the higher of your two midterm grades are, right? So even if, you know, not counting whatever homework and quizzes are left, you should always submit those because they're, um, you know, relatively easy points to get. Um, so what's left is, you know, your exam is the big thing that's left. And nominally, that's worth 30%, but it can be worth as much as 55% uh, 
So I think what that means is that everybody still has the uh, ability to, um, you know, to pass the class, right? And I've had a couple of questions about whether or not that's still possible. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows that that is still possible. Um, I don't know exactly how things work at the registrar, but I mean, you're talking about an extra 10 days or 14 days of effort or something, right? So my, my advice would be to stick through to the end of the class um, to see what happens. But I, I'm not sure what, uh, like how the registrar deals with any of that. Um, that being said, before we get to uh, the topic for today, I'm happy to entertain any uh, questions people have about the exam. Although if it is more, more detailed or more specific to your individual case, it might be better to have a private conversation um, that we can schedule versus something that I'm going to post on YouTube. Um, maybe one question about um, question three. I believe it was part uh, C where we had to find the uh, enthalpies at each state. Yep. Um, so, um, you know, the, the process, I think that I would usually follow the process that you've been teaching throughout the class um, to use the first law first and get that symbolic solution before yep. you fix the states. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that process might not have really applied to that part because you had to fix the states right away. Yeah, I think you, uh, you're, you're right. So that question um, is a question that I pulled from a question bank. So you're right that it's not um, exactly the way that we would normally do it. Although mm. if you did, you know, if that was, I can't remember, part A, I think, was write down your assumptions. Part B, I think, was draw the TS diagram. Part yeah. C, I think, was find the enthalpies. And then part D, I think, was, um, you know, find the thermal efficiency. And then part E, I think, was find the back work ratio. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to use the process that, that we typically use, the process that I'm teaching in class, I think you may have looked at that and said part C, well, that's the part that's going to take a long time. I think I'd rather go and do parts D and E first because I can, you know, take the first law and get quick symbolic solutions there mm -hmm. and then go back and do the uh, fixing the states. Okay. Right. And in that problem, I think, again, it's tough when there's only five uh, tests to say, like, what's, what's a common error. But for a problem like that in a Rankine cycle, if you try to isolate a common error that people make, it's... Um, it's going through that ideal pump is you got to remember that that's the specific volume times the change in pressure. Mm. And then you got to get the units right when you do that. Okay. Um, quickly, just one more question for uh, question two. Um, I was a little bit confused because it said it was a, the device was a diffuser and in the, problem text like the actual question is said that the inlet velocity was 360 feet per second and then the outlet velocity was also 360 feet. I did feet. see this when I was grading it that I made a mistake here. Um, so what the Yeah, I was a little confused by that too. In the table but not in the text. So the way that I've graded that question um, is that I looked exactly at the process that you did. So I don't care about the number and mm -hmm. if you ended up um, neglecting the change in the kinetic energy, I didn't penalize you for that because okay. of the text in the question, because I agree that that was a misleading thing. Okay. So there, I was grading mostly, you know, did you write down the first law and or write down your assumptions? I would always say write down the base level of the first law, write down your assumptions, get to an equation, right? And then try to fix the state. So I, I, uh, because of the mistake that I made in the question there, I graded that part um, more on the process than the number because it's, okay. know, I didn't penalize people for taking the kinetic energy coming in from either the table or from the text because those two things mm. were different. Okay. I also noticed, uh, I, I was thinking about using the table velocities. But the velocities um, were in feet squared per second, right? So right, yeah. Type of what I mean. So I'd say, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions about the exam? Okay. So 
now we're done with the second exam, right? So, so we've done the first exam. That was sort of like closed processes. The second exam was kind of open processes and an introduction to cycle analysis. What we do for the rest of the class is all cycle analysis. So we move through several cycles fairly quickly. So again, I think the way to do this is to treat all of these cycle analysis problems as being the same, and I'll present a flowchart for that, but that there's different paths, right? So different branching paths you can take depending on the answers to particular questions. So for the remainder of the class, we'll start with internal combustion engines. We'll talk about auto and diesel cycles. Then we'll talk about gas power plants, which are Brayton cycles. Then we'll talk about turbojet engines. So these you'd find on airplanes. They're basically a modified Brayton cycle. And then we'll get to uh, vapor compression and refrigeration um, heat pumps. And so vapor compression, refrigeration, and vapor compression heat pumps, right? So these are almost like Rankine cycles in reverse, right? So what this means is after today, right? So today is July the 16th. After today, we'll have eight more lectures of new content. Right, so that brings us to the end of week 10. And because RIT can't resist calling this a 10, 10 week term without having like an extra bit of a week at the end, right? So then we have two classes here in August that I would call week 11. Um, so these are going to be two open days. So these will be days where we can come in and ask questions. What I've done in the past is I've had students um, find problems in the textbook that they want me to do, but don't tell me what those problems are. So somebody just brings that problem in and I'll do it. Um, since we have more cycles than days off, the other thing that we could do uh, in addition to that is if people wanted to send me a question, then I could uh, I can make probably a YouTube video that's similar to what the lecture would be and sort of post that. So as we go through those, we can talk about ways that we can get some review material online for you. So, um, so we'll do review on the 3rd and 4th of August. Then the 5th is reading day. And then the exam period goes the 6th, the 9th, and the 10th. I think it's not a good idea to have the exam before the weekend. So my tentative plan is to have the exam on August the 9th. I'll be asking for um, people's availability on that day. And if they have conflicts, then the only other day that we have a chance to do this is the 10th, unless somebody wants to write on the weekend. So we, we, the exam period only runs from the 6th to the 10th. So I'll send out an email um, through my courses just asking people about what their availability looks like for that final exam. So it's a different day of the week than we've written all our other exams. So I don't know if the same timing will make sense for everybody. Does anybody have questions about the structure of the course uh, from now until the end? All right. So last class, I just want to touch a little bit about um, these rank and regeneration cycles, right? So we talked about we can increase the complexity. And one of the ways to do that is to bleed some of the mass in between these two turbines and use that to preheat the cold fluid before it goes into the steam generator. That's a way of reducing the amount of heat that we have to put into the cycle. It does reduce the net power, but on net, it increases our thermal efficiency. So this is a, a common way to improve the efficiency of Rankin cycles, right? So in these things, when we're thinking about thermal efficiency, we talk about the first law for the turbines and the pumps, right? That'll give us our, new, our, our numerator. We got to remember to add those things together if we're using m dot times h in minus h out, right? And then the heat added goes into our denominator in the thermal efficiency. In these problems, it's going to be tricky to find why, right? Why is the percentage of mass that you bleed off in between these two turbines? So invariably, you will have to do a first law analysis on this open feed water heater as well. And we talked about how to do that, that if you make the assumptions that you usually can make, this would be something like uh, the sum of m dot in h in is equal to the sum of m dot out h out. And then you can use that 
to find Y because there's different mass flow rates here in the problem. For a closed feed water heater, it's pretty similar. There's two turbines in one pump, right? There's still only one place where we're adding heat. But then here, you have this closed feed water heater. So that's one place, because I say, oh, you can find mass flow rates by looking at, so really when you're trying to find Y, you're trying to find a mass flow rate. So looking for components that are more than one inlet and more than one outlet, that's usually a good idea. But here there's two options, right? So you'll probably, again, have to do a first law analysis here on the closed feed water heater, but you might also look at this condenser, which is also more than one inlet and only one outlet here, right? But then there's also this heat loss term, right? So here, if we're looking for things that have more than one inlet or more than one outlet, you might settle on the condenser. So if you did that, you'd write down your first law, right? And you'd say it's steady state, it's passive, it's got no change in kinetic energy, no change in potential energy, but we can't say it's adiabatic, at least as it's drawn here, because we've got heat leaving the condenser. So we don't cross that term out, right? That one survives. And then the expression that we get looks like this. So here, there's a couple things I could ask you, right? I could ask you, if I gave you Q dot, I could ask you for Y, if you fixed all these states, right? Or if you knew Y, right? So maybe you could do the first law on the closed feed water heater to find Y, and then use that to find how much heat is rejected from the system, right? So there's different ways to do this. But if I knew the total mass flow rate and I could fix all the states, if I didn't know Q dot and I didn't know why, then I can't solve this equation right away, right? So then I might have to do a first law analysis on both the closed feed water heater and the condenser. So this is, I think that the, personally, I think that every, every cycle we'll talk about has a wrinkle or two or three, right? But I think that the Rankine reheat or the Rankine regeneration problems are one of the most difficult problems that we do in the class. And that's because here we split the mass because the um, conservation of mass isn't, um, you know, all the mass flow rates are the same. Then finding why here can be tricky. And it means that we, we might have to use the first law more than, um, you know, more than once, right? Certainly in, well, in this class, you use the first law a lot once you start talking about cycles. But here, even after you do the turbines and the pumps, you might still have to do it twice if it's a closed feed water heater. The other thing, right, so talking about problems. So what I've always done on, on exams is I try to ask at least one question that's different than something that you've seen. So you could see a problem on an exam that has maybe three or four turbines that uses open feed water heaters and closed feed water heaters, right? but then you'd get a state table that's mostly filled in, right? And then I'd be asking you questions like, oh, how can you find why? And you'd look at the information that you have and you'd say, oh, where's a good place where I can find why, right? Or I'd ask you, oh, you know, what's the net power, right? And then you see you need why, or maybe, maybe the, the textbook starts using Y prime and Y double prime, but sometimes I like just different letters, right? So maybe it's Y and, and Z and, and A or something, right? Um, and then that gives you an opportunity to demonstrate the understanding of the material rather than kind of, again, looking through and finding a homework solution that's similar to, to an exam problem. So I think if you understand how to do the process, a really complicated cycle like that, where it, while it might be, um, you know, scary when you first look at it because it's not something that you've seen before, it's, um, it's certainly doable if you trust the process. Right? So here, in this case, because we have more than one variable that we don't know, we'd have to find Q dot out to find Y, or we'd have to find Y to find Q dot out. So in the same way that I like to think about open and closed system problems as being sort of the same problem, we're just answering different questions. I want to put together a roadmap for how we solve any thermodynamic cycle. Right? So we're going to go through these cycles pretty fast, right? It might feel like drinking from a fire hose. But the good news is, if you follow this process, all of these cycle problems are kind of the same problem. So the first thing is, 
we need to know the characterization parameter. So if it's a heat engine, it's thermal efficiency. And if it's a temperature management device, it's coefficient of performance. But coefficient of performance is different for refrigeration units and for um, heat pumps. Then we ask ourselves the question, when I look at all the processes in the system or in the cycle, am I gonna assume that they're open system processes? So I'd use this equation we've been doing on the second law, or are they closed system processes or can I model them as closed system processes where we'll use the equation delta E is equal to Q minus W like we did on the first exam, right? So we'll have some cycles that use both of these um, different equation sets. So we need to ask ourselves, is the cycle open or closed, right? And then I do conservation of mass, pretty easy in a closed system, right? Because nothing happens, right? But difficult in a rank and regeneration cycle because the mass flow rates in the different components at the different outlets can be different, right? Then we do the first law on all the elements. Again, I encourage you to write it down once and then just tell me what assumptions you're making for each different component. Then we may have to do the second law on all or some of the elements to try to find that sigma dot term, see if it's something is possible or not. And then we'll have these symbolic solutions. So then we say, oh, I got all these equations that have like delta U or delta H or delta S. How do I find those numbers? And the first part of that question is what's the fluid, right? And if the fluid is water or something like it, then we use a vapor dome. And if it's ideal gases, then we don't use a vapor dome. And we have to say, is it constant specific heat or variable specific heat? So then I got to fix all the states, right? So this is gonna, you know, this is a lot of times the hard part because, you know, different states get fixed in different ways, right? Like the ideal pump is different from other subcooled liquids, right? So but we use different tables and equations to fix the states. And then once I have those numbers, then I put them back into the symbolic solutions that I developed over here. And then I take those solutions and I put numbers in and I get a numerical answer for each process, right? So I, if it's a power producing component, then I can find power, right? And then I can put those numbers back into my symbolic solution for the coefficient or for the characterization parameter, right? And I can tell you what's the thermal efficiency. And then sometimes I can compare the thermal efficiency of the cycle to the ideal, co or to the ideal characterization parameter. So for example, I could compare the um, actual thermal efficiency to the Carnot efficiency, right? So this is the general process, but it's also six points long. And like I said, I'm not great at memorizing things. So six points, kind of a lot of points. So I broke this down into three big questions that we're gonna ask about every cycle. The first is how do we characterize the cycle, right? So this is what's the energy benefit and what's the energy cost? Because the characterization parameter is always benefit over cost. The second big question is, are we gonna model the processes in the cycle as open systems or closed systems? This is an important question because it tells me what equations I need to use. The last question that we'll ask is, what's the fluid? Because when I know what the fluid is, then I know I can at least dramatically narrow down how to fix the states, right? And then the rest of it is just get numbers and you know, do some arithmetic, right? Now, you know, I'm certainly not one that doesn't fat finger my calculator on exams, right? So I don't mean to um, minimize the arithmetic part, but I do think that the roadmap part is the most important thing, right? I'm not generally too concerned about your numerical answer, right? I'm, I'm interested in the understanding that you demonstrate. And if on these cycle problems, you answer these three questions and follow this process, then you demonstrate that you understand how to do thermodynamics as opposed to, um, you know, you're just writing stuff down and hoping for the best, right? Or you're trying to model it after a homework problem where then really what's your, you know, if, you're, if that's how you're doing these open book exams, really the skill you're learning is, um, you know, how to find uh, a similar problem, right? Um, so, you know, I want you to, the skill you'd be learning is how to do thermodynamics, right? So, so I think if you follow this process, then, then you'll learn how to do thermodynamics, right? So we've been talking about Rankine cycles, right? And now we're gonna talk about a totally different cycle, right? We're gonna move from Rankine cycles to internal combustion engines. 
right? Now, this, you know, it's maybe not completely different. Maybe it's only partially different, as we'll see, because we can talk about these cycles in terms of these three questions, and some of the answers will be the same, and some of them will be different, right? Now, I always get a little bit nervous when I teach this class because I'm not a car person, right? I know maybe that's um, sacrilege for a mechanical engineer, but, uh, you know, to me, a car is a tool that gets you from point A to point B, um, right? And, and hopefully it lasts a long time, right? So I think more of the financial sort of part of car ownership rather than the, like, raw power part, right? And I know that's different than a lot of mechanical engineers. I know there could be people here that are on the formula team that will know a lot more about these, this terminology that I'm about to share with you. But the good news is, even someone who's not a car person like me um, can still sort of get what's going on here, right? Um, so first, what's an internal combustion engine, right? So this is a cutaway of an internal combustion engine, right? Remember for the first part of the class, we talked about piston cylinder assemblies, right? These are pretty important things in these internal combustion engines. So what's happening is, as this shaft is turning, these pistons are moving up and down, right? This is a four cylinder engine, right? And they're in line. And what's happening is even though these are at the same height, they're probably moving in different directions. And each one of these cylinders is doing a different job at a different time. So internal combustion engines are different than Rankine cycles in many ways. But in one of the ways is that um, in a Rankine cycle, we have different components that are doing different jobs. And to do that different job, the fluid moves to different physical locations. But in these internal combustion engines, the fluid stays generally in the piston. And the piston cylinder assembly does all the different jobs at different times, depending on what's going on with these valves. And we'll talk about that too, right? Internal combustion engines, obviously these are imp an important thing, even though you know, there's certainly a movement and, and maybe a justification for um, minimizing our reliance on internal combustion engines. And, you know, maybe in the not too distant future, I don't know that we'd ever eliminate the internal combustion engine, but certainly uh, dramatically reduce it, right? So there's, you know, obviously lots of companies looking at things like electric vehicles uh, or hybrid vehicles or hydrogen vehicles or how we can get away from, from using um, the internal combustion engine, right? So, our first question, right, is how do we characterize the system, right? So then it's what's the energy benefit, right? The energy benefit of an internal combustion engine, because it's a heat engine, is power, right? So the, the benefit of the engine is that it's doing work for us, right? So we traded in, you know, our pack horse for a, uh, you know, for a Corolla, right? Or maybe a monster truck, right? Um, so here, what we're trying to do, the reason that we have this engine is that it's doing work for us, right? It's replacing human, well, really, we, we went with human muscle power to animal muscle power, and then to, you know, the Industrial Revolution, where machines were doing the work for us, right? Um, and then what's the energy cost, right? Again, it's a heat engine. For heat engines, the energy cost is that we have to generate heat. For internal combustion engines, we typically do this by burning some kind of a liquid fuel, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, gasoline or diesel fuel, right? So here, the energy cost is the heat or the heat rate, right? So that means if I start to talk about how do I characterize the cycle, it's a thermal efficiency, just like a Rankine cycle, right? So the characterization parameter here, because it's a heat engine, is still thermal efficiency. Thermal efficiency, all of these characterization parameters are benefit over cost, but thermal efficiency specifically is going to be net work over heat in or net power divided by heat rate in. And then we can make that substitution that W dot net is equal to Q dot in minus Q dot out. Assuming these are absolute values. Right, so this part hopefully is a little bit familiar because it's like a Rankine cycle. Right, so this part, hopefully, you know, we're not um, breaking too much new ground here. We're just applying something we knew to a different cycle. Right, so if we think about those three questions, right, so here's our picture of a Rankine cycle, right? Here's our sketch of an internal combustion engine. They're both heat engines, so we characterize them the same way, right? We use thermal efficiency. What's our next question? Are we going to model the, off, the, the processes as open system or closed system processes, right? So even though it's not strictly true, for internal combustion engines, 
we're going to assume that it's a closed system all the time. It's not really. It's a closed system about half the time because sometimes one or the other of these valves are open. But you'll see why we do this because even um, a simple model is, you know, a simple model you can do is better than a very complicated model you can't do, right? So, um, right, this is kind of a not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good kind of thing, right? Now, the last of our three big questions is what's the fluid? So for Rankine cycles, the fluid was water or something like it that's moving back and forth across the vapor dome. For internal combustion engines, we find out this isn't exactly true either, but we will model these things as if the working fluid was only an ideal gas, typically air, right? Really, it's some air fuel mixture and, you know, it goes, undergoes a chemical process as we're burning the fuel, but we're not going to concern ourselves with all of that, right? We're going to pretend that it's air the whole time, right? So, you know, at first, this is why I said it's partially different because it's still a heat engine, right? So we have these three questions. One of our questions is the same, but two of them, the answer is different. Right? So it's kind of the same, but it's kind of different too. Right? So it's just branching paths on our flow chart. So now we'll talk a little bit about um, you know, nomenclature for a piston cylinder assembly. Right? So the piston is the part that moves up and down. Right? The cylinder right, is the hollow cylinder that it moves up and down in. Right? So this is kind of a very basic sketch of what this might look like. Right? So the piston is the part that's moving. It's going up and down. Now, its lowest point of travel is called bottom dead center, right? That's the piston at its lowest point. Conversely, its uppermost part is top dead center, right? Notice that top dead center is not at the top of the cylinder, right? Because the, we don't have the piston face bashing into this surface here. There's some gap in between there, right? So top dead center, and bottom dead center. The piston moves between these two positions, right? And the length of movement there is called the stroke length, right? So if your piston cylinder assembly undergoes one stroke, that means it moves from top dead center to bottom dead center or from bottom dead center to top dead center, right? If it goes all the way from bottom dead center up to top and then back down to bottom, then it's gone two strokes, right? And if it does that twice, then it's gone four strokes. Now there's two volumes that we get concerned with in the piston cylinder assembly as well. So one is called the displacement volume. So let's pretend that the piston was open, that there's two valves in here, which you could see in the last picture, but they're not here. But let's pretend the exhaust valve is open, right? Why does exhaust come out the back of your car? It's because after you've kind of spent this air fuel mixture, right? After you've burned the fuel, you've got to get that air out because you want new air coming in so you have more oxygen so you can burn the fuel, right? So if one of these valves are open and this piston moves up, then you displace all of this volume, right? It gets pushed out, right? And then what would happen is one valve would close, the other would open, and then you move back down, you suck air back. Right? So the displacement volume, that's going to be that stroke length times the cross-sectional area inside your cylinder. But then there's also this uh, volume at the top, right? Because not all of the volume in the cylinder gets displaced because the, the top dead center doesn't go right up to the top of the piston uh, or of the cylinder face, right? So it doesn't hit that thing right away. So there's some volume that does not get displaced. So if you're into cars, probably you've heard of this term before, but if you haven't, that's okay. Um, there's something when you talk about different engines called a compression ratio. And as we start to analyze these engines, we'll see why this is important, right? I just like this animation, right? Um, so we've got our uh, piston and it's moving from top dead center to bottom dead center. So there's two volumes here. There's the volume at bottom dead center, which is the displacement volume plus that extra volume that's at the top. And then there's going to be the volume at top dead center. So there's two volumes that are associated with our two end positions of the piston travel. Right? Our compression ratio, always bigger than one, is the big volume. So that's the volume at bottom dead center 
divided by the small volume, that's the volume at top dead center. So this is kind of a, you know, it might seem like a simplistic thing, right? Because it's just talking about the geometry of our piston. But we'll see that in the simple model we're going to create, if you know the compression ratio, you'll know something about, or at least if you change the compression ratio, if you say, I'm going to increase the compression ratio of my engine, you'll see that automatically you'll know something about the performance of the engine when you do that. Right? But we'll get to that as we do the model. Right? Now, if you're driving your car, right, you have a tachometer, right? So it tells you the RPM, right? How fast your engine is going. So we talk about engine speed because this piston, right, is connected to a drive shaft that's spinning, right? So we talk about our engine speed in terms of RPM, right? Rotations per minute. Now, you might want this in radians per second, right? So we got to think about our unit conversion, right? So one rotation is two pi radians, right? So I can get rid of the rotation by multiplying by two pi radians over one rotation. And I can get rid of the minutes by dividing by one, by multiplying by one minute over 60 seconds, right? So that's how we go from RPM into radians per second, which, you know, as you're doing calculations, you might find is a useful thing, right? So here we just, we track our units, we do our calculations and we get radians per second. So, there's different ways we can classify engines, right? So for um, smaller engines like this dirt bike, or maybe if you've got like a gas powered, uh, you know, grass trimmer, right? Or weed whacker or whatever, um, it might only run on a two stroke engine. So a two stroke engine is going to go through the whole thermodynamic cycle in two strokes, right? So two strokes is the piston goes up once and the piston comes down once. That's two strokes. Now here, Right, so here we can see, you know, this drive shaft is going to move around in one rotation, right? You'll go up once and down once. So one revolution of your drive shaft will give you two strokes of your piston, right? Because the piston will get back to the same place it was at the beginning of your rotation, right? So if you go from 12 o'clock back to 12 o'clock, then, uh, then, you know, your piston has gone, say, up as you went from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and then back down as you went from 6 o'clock back to 12 o'clock. Right? So every revolution gives you two strokes. A two-stroke engine does two strokes in one revolution, and two strokes is an entire cycle for a two-stroke engine. But as things start to get bigger, as your engines start to get more powerful, then you, um, you use a four-stroke engine. Right? So in a four-stroke engine, right, like in this motorcycle or, you know, in, uh, you know, if you got a, say, a, you know, Toyota Corolla or something, it's going to have a four-stroke engine. So your four-stroke engine needs four strokes to do the whole cycle, right, which means that it needs two full revolutions of the drive shaft, right? We'll see how that becomes important as we start to do the calculation. So it's important. Two-stroke engines do a cycle in one revolution. Four-stroke engines do a cycle in two revolutions. And so that's one way that we can characterize different internal combustion engines. Another way we can characterize internal combustion engines is how we burn the fuel, right? So how does the fuel become combusted, right? So typically, right, most probably commercial vehicles are spark ignition, right? So, um, right, my, my Corolla was a spark ignition engine, right? So this is typically done for lower power applications, right? Um, typically for lighter weight vehicles, um, it's typically lower cost, right? So what happens here is as the piston comes up, right? There's a spark plug, right? And you know this is the, the timing here is is you know there's there's going to be different components in your engine that are dealing with the timing that set off that spark, you know, at the right time so that the fuel gets um, consumed when you want it to as the engine is going, right? So it's a pretty, you know, for mechanical engineers, I see why lots of mechanical engineers like internal combustion engines because it's a really complicated system and, it, and it's very sort of elegant and beautiful, right? Um, again, for me, it's just a way to get from point A to point B, but I appreciate all the people that are working hard doing this, right? So most, um, you know, passenger cars are, uh, are spark plug ignition in North America, right? The other way you can do this 
right? So uh, my understanding is that diesel engines typically work on compression ignition. So here what happens as your piston's going up, right? The pressure, you know, both valves are closed. The pressure inside the system keeps going up, but so does the temperature, right? So if you can compress that fluid enough, the temperature gets driven up so that combustion of the fuel happens naturally without needing something like a, uh, an external spark, right? So here um, you get better fuel efficiency if you're using high power, right? So if you're talking about, um, you know, buses or, you know, tugboats maybe, right? So, you know, things that are using, uh, you know, these sort of diesel compression engines, right? Are things that typically require, you know, have higher power requirements, right? So we can, you, you know, again, we can subdivide engines into spark ignition and compression ignition. So how do they burn the fuel? So now let's look at what goes on inside an engine, right? So this, uh, we lost our x-axis label, but this is a PV diagram. And you can see why we're going to make a lot of assumptions in this cycle, because this PV diagram is pretty complicated, right? Um, so we're going to start with our piston moving down. Now, as our piston is moving down, we're going to open one of these valves. We'll call it the intake valve, right? So as our piston is moving down, mass in the form of air from outside comes into our piston cylinder assembly, right? Because the piston is moving down, it's creating low pressure. It's like a straw, right? It's sucking the air in, right? So that means <coughs> this first stroke as the piston is dropping with that valve open, is the intake stroke, because it's taking air into the piston. And then what happens here is our intake valve closes, right? Because now the piston is going to go up. And as the piston goes up, we don't want it to push the air out yet, right? What we want is for it to increase the pressure and the temperature of the fluid, right? So what's going to happen is now the piston starts to move up, right? And it compresses that gas, right? It's not just an ideal um, gas, right? It's some air fuel mixture, right? And then combustion initiates, right? So whether, you know, this picture is a spark ignition, right? So, um, you know, that spark goes off, right? So this is kind of like, bam, right? Like the, uh, you know, and because we ignite that fuel, then that gas wants to expand because it rapidly, the temperature increased, right? So now what happens is, because that gas wants to expand, it pushes the piston down. This is the whole reason we do the cycle, right? This is the equivalent of the turbine in the Rankine cycle. This is the power stroke. As this gas is expanding, it's pushing that piston down. And the cool thing about this is as it pushes the piston down, that's what's turning the drive shaft, right? And that's why you have multiple pistons in your system and the pistons are staggered so that they're in power stroke at a different time, right? But then once your engine gets started, it's kind of self-perpetuating because one of the pistons is always gonna be in the power stroke, always pushing down, always rotating that shaft. And the reason it's doing that is because some other piston is in the compression stroke and pushing up, right? So it's using that mechanical power to compress the fluid in a different cylinder. Right now, starting is the hard part, right? That's why now you have a starter motor in your uh, in your car, right? So this is an electric motor that that starts your engine, right? This is also why, like way back in the day, you ever see like pictures of like you know Model T Fords and stuff, you know, some guy'd get out there with a crank, right, and he'd start the thing going because you sort of needed that inertia to get the system to work, right? Um, but it's better than uh, you know a horse, right? Um, so now. After this um, expansion happens, the piston's at the bottom, but we've got this spent air fuel mixture in the system, right? We can't just keep doing the cycle with that same air because every time, you know, every little bit of fuel that we burn, we turn some oxygen into carbon dioxide, right? Hopefully only carbon dioxide, right? If you get complete combustion. Um, now what happens is eventually the oxygen content, you know, would be depleted and you wouldn't be able to burn the fuel anymore because the fuel needs oxygen to burn. So what happens is the next part is the exhaust stroke. So now we open the other valve 
called the exhaust valve, right? And now the piston moves up. And as the piston moves up, because it's open now to the atmosphere, that it's not, um, what are we going to say? It's not going to compress the fluid. Instead, mass is going to go out the exhaust valve, right? And now this is a cycle, and we just keep going around and around and around and around, right? So each cylinder is doing something different, right? One is always going to be in the power stroke because another one is always in the compression stroke, right? So it's like, you know, they're constantly, you know, flipping sides and helping each other out, right? Um, now, as you can see from this PV diagram, this is a super complicated system. And if you wanted to actually get like a real number and analyze this as it is, you need a computer, basically. You can't really do this by hand if you um, want to model the universe as it is, right? And that's why, you know, as engineers, oftentimes our job is to, um, you know, deal with the universe as it is, right? Or try to make things and make things better using imperfect information, right? So we're gonna make a lot of assumptions on this cycle, right? So real internal combustion engines are really tough to model, right? They're not adiabatic, right? Um, there's not just one working fluid in here because we have combustion. So really there's chemistry going on inside of our uh, system, right? There's kinetic energy can be important as the pistons are moving up and down here. It's transient, so it's not at steady state. Things are changing with time. And sometimes this system is open, right? Sometimes like in the exhaust and intake strokes, and sometimes it's closed, like in the compression and the power strokes, right? So it's actually very complicated. The good news is, as engineers, we can build a simple model. We're gonna make a lot of assumptions, right? We're gonna step further away from reality and move towards that cartoon version of an internal combustion engine. But the good news is that even that simple model is gonna help us. Right? So we're going to do what we call an air standard analysis. And to do so, we're going to make several assumptions. Right? So we're going to neglect combustion. We're going to say that um, we're not burning any fuel. We're transferring heat into the system and transferring heat out of the system. So we're only going to talk about heat transfer. We're not going to talk about you know, the chemical reactions and combustion and burning the fuel. Right? We're going to pretend that the system is a closed system the whole time. So we're going to use the first law, but it'll be delta E is equal to Q minus W and not, um, you know, DE by DT is equal to a lot of stuff, right? So typically we'll use U, specific internal energy, instead of H, specific enthalpy, right? Although, I mean, a lot of times you learn rules just to break them. So we will see that H rears its head sometimes. We're going to assume that all of these processes are ideal, right? Or reversible. You know, in part, we're making a bunch of assumptions anyway, right? Um, so here, we're just going to say everything's ideal. That'll give us some idea. But what this means, right, is every time we move away, if you do an analysis and it says, oh, this engine uh, produces 100 horsepower, you can't really be super confident in that number. But if you say, oh, it, you know, it was producing uh, 100 horsepower, and then I changed the compression ratio, and then it was producing 120 horsepower, then you're relatively confident that changing that compression ratio will move directionally the power in a certain direction, right? So you get some qualitative information about how the engine performs. You might be able to make some design decisions, um, but this is why we build prototypes, right? Because um, modeling especially simple modeling like this, you know, can only get you so far. And even more complicating modeling still has, um, you know, issues with it. We'll say that the working fluid is an ideal gas that's air the whole time, even though really it's this complex air fuel mixture, which changes before and after we combust the fluid, right? Um, but we're not, we're just gonna neglect all that. We're just gonna say, yeah, it's just air, right? And then sometimes, we will also, because our working fluid is air, sometimes we'll also assume that, um, that that air has constant specific heat, right? And then we talk about doing a cold air standard analysis. I think here, because we're assuming that, um, that the, te the change in the temperature is not changing the, the properties of the fluid, right? So 
Um, because of all this, you know, the answers that we get are more qualitative than quantitative, right? You might get a sense of how making different design changes will change your performance, but I wouldn't really put a ton of stock in the number that you get, right? So that's why you, that's why we build things, right? Or we build models of things, or we do more complicated numerical models after we do a simple, a simpler analytical model like this. Now, remember, simple is not easy. Simple means uncomplicated. Right? And because we make all these assumptions, we make the analysis less complicated than it actually is. Right, So it's simpler. But it's still difficult to do these internal combustion engine processes, particularly as we get to diesel. Um, I won't finish this lecture, but I'll do these next couple slides. Um, so one way we characterize cycles is with the thermal efficiency. But we can also characterize an internal combustion engine as the mean effective pressure, or MEP. This, here you take the net work done in one cycle and you divide it by the displacement volume, right? So this is a fictitious thing. This pressure is not like a physical pressure that exists in the engine or so, oh, well, maybe it does for a particular instance in time, right? But this is like, um, right? Because you know that if pressure was constant, right? Remember work is the integral of PDV. But if pressure was constant, then work is just um, pressure times delta V. So this is kind of a way to have one number that tells you something about um, how much work you're getting for a particular displacement volume. Right? So if you have engines that have the same displacement volume, then if you can increase the mean effective pressure, what's happening is you're increasing the net work. Right? So this is sort of a you know, a basic characterization, right? And if you have two engines that are running at the same speed, then if you increase the mean character, the mean effective pressure, you're also increasing the net work, right? So there's a couple things that you can find from the mean effective pressure just by knowing this number, right? So if you're comparing two different engines, sometimes knowing the mean effective pressure can be useful. Right, so we talked about this, that we talked with heat engines, um, we do thermal efficiency. This part, I think we'll save for next class. I will start with this next class, talking about how we do the analysis. But you can see, because it's a closed system, that we start to talk about, um, you know, back to the closed version of the first law, where delta U, you know, really it was delta E and then we made some assumptions is equal to Q minus W, right? So that's what we're going to do for this first law stuff. So we'll get back to, you know, potentially what's the pressure volume relationship? How do we find the work? And then how do we fix the state? But now we're trying to find U instead of H. But that is where I'll stop today. We uh, didn't quite get through everything here, but I'll start here next class. Um, but I do think it was valuable to talk a little bit about the exam at first. So thank you, everybody. Is I will it, stick around if people have questions. And I have office hours today at 2. Is there a homework for this week that we have to do this weekend? I'm trying to remember if there was one. So, yeah, the homework that's related to the, the lectures that we did today, I'm a little bit hesitant to push that homework ahead like I did last time just because we're already on a short cycle with the 10 week schedule. And um, if we push all those problems to the following week, you're gonna just have so much to do that I think that it's worse. So um, I recognize that it would be nice to, to have a weekend off from doing homework, but I think that, uh, I think in the long run, it's for the best if we keep that due date where it is. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. All right, have a good day. You're welcome. You too. Thank you. Have a good day. Yep. Bye-bye.